So let's get started on our whirlwind whistle stop tour of sexualities and autism. That is right. Whistle is whistle stop a thing or is it whirlwind? You know, it's one or the other. It's it's going to be quick, not in depth because I don't want to go in depth because I'm lazy. I mean, busy. <laughs> What I want to do is go through some of the more common sexualities that autistic people identify as. But it's important to say a couple of things. Number one, this is clearly not an exhaustive list. Okay. Number two, it is a myth that all autistic people are sexless robots. It doesn't mean there aren't autistic people who do identify as asexual or any of the other sexualities we're going to discuss. It just means that you can't just say all autistic people are like emotionless, sexless robots because that is clearly not the case. In addition to my list, I just wanna be clear, I'm not going to go into the sexualities that you would identify as gay or lesbian. I think they are so widely known that it's better to shine a light on some lesser known sexualities. Okay. So let's get started. The first sexuality I want to discuss, and as you watch this, some of these may resonate with you, and I hope that is the case, because in doing this video, all I'm really trying to do is open up and empower the voices of autistic people right across the planet who, who may still be lost in their sexuality journey. So let's kick it off with aromantic, also known as arrows. An aromantic person simply has no desires or interests in romantic relationships, making them Romantic. Now where it gets a little bit tricky and a bit confusing, but I'll, I'll try to keep it as simple as I can, not for you, for me. <laughs> uh, you can be aromantic and asexual, or you can just be aromantic, or you can be none of the above. And this is where the myths hopefully get broken down, this idea that all autistic people are just, I don't know, sex repulsed, potentially, which uh, it isn't the case. That is a thing. But it isn't the case with regards to all autistic people. So I guess the point is, just like neurotypical people have many and varied sexualities, so do autistic people, because we're all humans, right? I guess the main point is in saying this, is not all autistic people lack a sexual or romantic desire. But if you're aromantic, you do. Let's move on now to the sexuality of asexual, also known as aces. So an asexual person, an ace, lacks feelings, desires, and attraction to others. Asexual people, like I mentioned before with arrows, they shouldn't be confused with people who are sex repulsed because there are asexual people out there, aces out there, that still have sexual relationships for the benefit of their partner. So it's not because they want to do it or they need to do it, but they feel comfortable doing it for the, I guess, the health of their own relationship. And to be clear, I think it's really important to understand that people who are asexual, aces, they aren't choosing to be asexual, okay? It's not like they've taken a vow of celibacy or whatever. It's not a choice, it's not a phase, they won't grow out of it. People who are genuinely and actually born asexual people, well, they simply lack the feelings of sexual desire and attraction. The third sexuality I want to explore, and in my opinion, a sexuality that can seem very connected to autistic people when you dig deep and look into it, and something that I absolutely resonate with, and we'll get to my personal experiences at the end of the video, but the sexuality I'm talking about is demisexuality, so a demisexual. Put simply, a demisexual only feels and has sexual attraction for someone they share a strong emotional bond with. So it's the bond that opens up the attraction as opposed to ways a lot of people live, which is sexual attraction then opens up to a bond, right? Well, that's the reverse for demisexuals, pretty much for me and probably for a lot of autistic people. And the way I look at it and the way it resonates with me is as an autistic person, you can go through your life struggling to make and maintain friendships, relationships, all the types of things that you wanna do in life, you just really struggle with. And number one, it's hard to get them going, and number two, it's hard to keep them alive. So the idea that you require a strong emotional bond to have a sexual relationship makes sense to me because as an autistic person, not only, as I said, it's hard to find friends and keep friends, but it can be hard to trust that people actually accept you 
and like you because as a rule, as an autistic person, you, you know, really your life is you wake up, you go into the real world, you get rejected for being yourself. So you have to put your mask on just to be tolerated. Not even really embraced, but just, yeah, okay, well, so we'll tolerate the weird dude because he's trying to be normal, right? He's trying to be normal. It's, there's no normal. Everyone's different. Anyway, anyway, so the idea that it's hard to find friends, to keep friends, to believe they like you for who you are. Because I find a lot of friendships, relationships break down when an autistic person acts autistic. And that sounds kind of bizarre. We're always autistic, but when we're masking or camouflaging our true, genuine, unique, autistic self, it's more comfortable for those we're with. But when we become autistic, when we have a meltdown or a shutdown or a burnout or whatever, it can be confronting for people who don't understand it, embrace it or accept it, and it can end friendships. It can end relationships. It's, it's the equivalent of you dumping someone or no longer be, being someone's friend because they had a medical seizure they couldn't control. When an autistic person has an autistic meltdown, shutdown, burnout, or you know, an autistic response, it's not controllable. It's a neurological developmental disability. The brain is reacting to something in life that has become too much. So you're dumping someone or not being their friend anymore because they were having an uncontrollable response to being autistic. It's like, when I think about it, it just blows my mind. But I'm telling you right now, friends, they come and go, man. <laughs> when I was young, relationships come and go the second you be yourself. And it's not about treating people badly, but it's about people understanding, which, and that's not acceptable. It's about people understanding that if you're going to date or be friends with an autistic person, you're going to need to understand from time to time they will be autistic. Now think about that. As an autistic person, I already understand I'm not entitled on planet Earth to be autistic all the time. And the other personal connection I find I have to demisexuality, that emotional bond, is, you know what, there's no point lying about your life. You've got to be true. As a young guy, hey, I mean, I like sexual activity and my own personal preference. You know, I like women and sexual activity like any guy does growing up. So it wasn't like I outright rejected casual experiences with women if they came up. But there's a couple of things I do remember. Number one, for the most part, 99.9, I mean, maybe even 100% of these casual experiences never got to the point of actual sex, right? They were just the stuff leading up to, right? Even just doing that after the fact or during the fact, I could feel really uncomfortable and I didn't know why. And, and a lot of times I'd have this weird guilt feeling afterwards, even though both of us were not only really happy and comfortable in the experiences and it was completely consensual and all that kind of stuff, I still had this weird, odd feeling, uncomfortable feeling, this guilt feeling where conversely, if I was able to form a strong emotional bond with a woman, with a person, I was able to not only have a fulfilling relationship, but also a fulfilling and comfortable sexual relationship. It's because when it lacks the strong emotional bond, you have that, you can pick up on the attraction to some degree. And you know, maybe it's not attraction, maybe it's more just like lust or you know, some sort of need, I don't know, animal need, I don't know. But it never seemed natural to the same degree that it would if you had a strong emotional bond, right? So you can acknowledge there's something there, but it's, it's almost in theory. In practice, it wasn't as how it felt in theory. Right? It was uncomfortable and you felt weird or awkward or, or guilty. Uh, you, and, and now I know it's, it's, it's this idea that me as an autistic person, you know, I require a strong emotional bond really with pretty much everyone in my life for all different reasons. But certainly you know, to maintain a healthy, uh, lasting relationship and sexual relationship, that strong emotional bond is super important to me. So that's why I so strongly identify with this particular form of sexuality and I wonder, how connected, how intertwined demisexuality, a strong emotional bond required for sexual attraction is within the autistic community. A couple of other forms of sexuality that I think are pretty common within the autistic community, although the wider world would never know and just think, you know, we're all sexless robots, are bisexuality and pansexuality, okay? So let's break them both down because a lot of people get confused on the differences. I get confused on the differences. It's, 
even now, I don't know if I've entirely got it, but I'm gonna try and work through this because I think it's really important that the world at large understand that autistic people can and are sexual beings, just like anyone else. It's okay for some autistic people to be completely non-sexual. They can be asexual, aromantic, and that's fine. But it's also important for the world to know that not all autistic people are. Some autistic people have fulfilling sexual relationships. Sometimes I feel like we're looked at as children, right? As like we're looked down upon. Like, oh, don't talk about that near them. It's like, what? Okay, so let's first talk about bisexuality. So a bisexual person is sexually attracted to individuals of their own gender and of other genders. And although I totally understand generally the definition is they are a bisexual person is in effect attracted to two genders, be that male and female, that isn't actually the case in all situations. I think it's okay to look at it like that, but I think it's important that we understand that when we talk about bisexuality and attracted to individuals from your own gender and other genders, it isn't a universal definition to then just say a bisexual person is attracted to two genders. So it's your gender and other genders. I think that's a more appropriate way of looking at bisexuality. On to pansexual and how does pansexual and bisexual go together or connect or interact? or other words my brain can't think of. Well, let's talk about it because it can be confusing because we talked about bisexuality being attracted to your gender or other genders, but then there's bi at the start and a lot of people can take that literally and it all gets confusing. Is there two genders? No, well, let's move on to slightly unpacking pansexual. And by unpacking, I mean a 50 minute lecture on the, no, I don't. So a pansexual person is romantically and sexually attracted to people of all genders. Now, that might sound very similar to bisexuality. And I guess the subtle difference is this. For a pansexual, gender isn't generally a consideration in if you are or are not attracted to an individual. So it's like gender isn't really even factored in. I guess another way of putting it is Pansexuals can have a gender preference, but it's not a focus. But most importantly, I'm not an expert in all of these sexualities. I haven't got lived experiences on all of these sexualities. I'm just doing my best to try and shine a light on the many and varied sexualities of autistic people, rather than just having people walking around thinking all autistic people are just sexless robots. And on the subject of sexless robots, let's talk about my own personal sexuality journey. <laughs> the moment you've all been waiting for. As a person diagnosed as autistic later in life, I had, in my opinion, the unfortunate experience of growing up, going through puberty and entering into the dating world as an undiagnosed autistic person. Now, I didn't have the title or the piece of paper, but I had clearly an autistic brain and autistic traits, and that absolutely impacted my dating. So if you're a parent or a carer, or you're an autistic person, maybe you're an autistic teenager, maybe you're in your 20s, it doesn't really matter. Let me tell you my experience. My experience is late. <laughs> Everything was late. Any kind of remote attraction to you know anyone, to girls in school, very late. Uh, the idea that I would even consider finding an attraction or dating someone or asking them out in my teens and for that matter, in my early 20s, not on my radar. I, I can't explain to you why. I think potentially as an autistic guy, certainly my emotional intelligence and, and my ability to understand that part of my life was pretty underdeveloped. It took time. As an autistic guy, I, I know, in my opinion, it takes time. I think 30s are 20s for autistic people, 40s are 30s, and we can keep going, but I guess what I'm trying to say is a lot of times people accomplish things in their teens and 20s that as an autistic guy, I might not have accomplished until my 20s and 30s. So there's a big difference there. It just didn't, it just didn't happen through teenage years and through early 20s. I just, it wasn't a priority. And in fact, I, rem I have memories in my really, really young 20s of people telling me, you realize 
she's trying to ask you out or do you, you realize she's interested in you, right? Or, and I'm like, no, I, I didn't, I just, no. <laughs> and I'm, you know, like I never asked her out because they told me that and I was like, okay, cool, thanks for telling me. Next, so it wasn't, it just wasn't there. I guess because I was really focused on my core interest, which was doing radio, being on the radio, being an entertainer, you know, creating content and all those types of things. So honestly, it really wasn't until probably my mid 20s, so my kind of early to mid 20s that I started even opening up to the idea of going on dates with people, going on dates with women. And what's funny is when I look back and do the numbers, it really wasn't more than a couple. Like honestly and truly in my 20s, I, in my entire decade of in my 20s, I don't think I could count more than on one hand of the amount of dates or not even partners, dates I went on or people I dated. It, it wasn't a lot. And again, I think that, that helps me go back to this connection I feel with demisexuality. So as an autistic guy, I came to the game late. It just wasn't on my radar. I just didn't feel it. And look, I think that's normal. That doesn't make me a sexless robot, right? That just makes me someone who wasn't there yet. My, because remember, <laughs> when you're autistic, you have a neurodevelopmental disability. Okay, so parts of my emotional development and my sexuality development, they, they were coming, they just, well, that's, that's, <laughs> they weren't coming. It, it happens over time. It's delayed, right? I mean, hello, no duh. As an autistic guy in my teens, in my 20s, the whole sexuality thing, the whole sex thing, attraction, girls, dating, I was completely out of my depth. I had absolutely no idea. I, I and never, ever, ever, ever knew or picked up on the fact that someone was interested in me, attracted to me, trying to get me to ask them out, even asking me out. I mean, it's, I never picked it up. People would point it out to me sometimes, and thank you to those people, but for the most part, yeah, just no insight, no understanding, and therefore nothing really happened. And you know, this is when I go on rants about things like love on the spectrum. And then a real insight into love on the spectrum is autistic people not knowing that other people like them or not opening up or asking people out and therefore there being no love. Like that's a real insight into love on the spectrum. You know, the, the show has people going on so many dates and second dates and third dates, it just doesn't happen if you're autistic. You just don't pick up on those signs or read those signals or ask people out. I mean, you just assume everyone doesn't like you. So that's realistic, for me, that's realistic. I can't speak on behalf of it. anyone else. This is my own personal autistic journey. And I guess what I'm saying is with regards to the teens being really non-existent, really having uh, seemingly lots of female friends and certainly lots of female friends that you know everyone else would class as popular or attractive. I certainly didn't date any of them, uh, I, but I, you know, they were all my friends. I hung out with them. Of course, I hung out with my mates as well. What I'm saying is I, you know, I had a lot of friends who were female, but I just didn't go on dates or, or have dates or whatever. It wasn't even there. And into my you know, young 20s, still kind of slowly building, and then you start to experience dates, but for me, the dates I had in my early 20s, when I look back now, I think are probably the equivalent of people going on dates in their early teens. It's that really nothing much happens, but you are excited to explore it, but you don't know much about everything, and there's a bit, I guess, a bit of naivety, ignorance, whatever. So it, you know, it was such a big delay there, and I, I was behind the eight ball. You know, when you start to date, interact with women in their 20s, and, and I guess, in, in a way you feel like a teenage boy, you know, it's tricky. It, it doesn't go well. With regards to my sexual experiences, like I talked about when I, we talked about demisexuality, I didn't realize why the bond was required and why I always felt so awkward or nothing ever happened properly or I felt guilty or yucky or just weird and uncomfortable after any kind of experience with someone who I just met or casually or wasn't in a relationship with. And now I know there was that lacking of an, a strong emotional bond and that put things back. But when I did find a strong emotional bond with partners in my 20s, I was able to open up, have relationships and, and have sexual activity. And another thing I'd say, as an autistic guy, I didn't lose my virginity until in my 20s. 
Now, that might seem normal to a lot of people. I actually don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know when people usually do it. If it's, I don't know, I, I can't tell you. High school, uni, wh whatever. It was really interesting because obviously it was good. <laughs> I mean, you know, I like it, it's great. It was, I was very inexperienced, but I'm glad it happened. I'm glad I had a relationship, but there was still a lot of confusion for me. And it, it's tricky. And, I, I, and because I didn't have the developmental things probably at the right stages, I was behind the eight ball, I was learning a lot of things on the run. And you get confused and you can be drawn into, I guess, lust and attraction and short-term things, but then they, you know, you, it's theory but not practice and you can't work out why and where, what's the connection and what do I need and relationships that can break down because of your, your lack of experience or understanding. And for me, it was, it was a really tricky time. I don't particularly look back on my 20s and go, wow, how good was that? But in saying that, maybe two relate, actual relationships I had in, in my 20s were strong emotional bonds. But clearly, in the end, as an autistic person, even though I was undiagnosed, I was born autistic, there's parts of me that, are, that are, can be hard to live with or, or tricky to navigate. And I understand that and I acknowledge that. You can't expect people to read your mind, literally, if you're not diagnosed. To experience these types of things in my 20s, feeling like kind of a teenage boy is my, is my genuine and real experience of, of sexuality and you know, sexual activity as an autistic guy growing up. This is gonna sound probably really, really bizarre and weird, but I'll tell you something, this is a genuinely, deeply personal experience. In my 20s, when I finally had relationships, and in relationships in your 20s, you tend to sleep over at each other's place, right? I mean, it's pretty normal. Well, this happened a lot, obviously, when you have a girlfriend. And this is, I don't know why, but the one thing that was hardest for me that I really struggled with for years was being able to go to sleep and sleep in my bed or their bed with them. For some reason, all the other stuff we could, we could get through and we had great emotional bonds where we were in a relationship, but for some reason there was something about having someone else in my bed with me for sleeping, for just going to bed. I, 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 don't, I can't explain why, but this was the biggest challenge for me. And I can tell you on more than one occasion, on many, many occasions, I was in effect awake the entire night. I couldn't work out because I really was a, I was a man, but I was in, I don't know, like a teenager's emotional body. I couldn't work out why I couldn't just close my eyes and go to sleep. I could, everything else was comfortable, but once it was sleep time, and me and my, my partner, my girlfriend, were in bed going to sleep, I couldn't actually go to sleep. This is not a joke, okay, I almost never, never got a proper night's sleep. For some reason, I just couldn't do it. I don't know why. As an autistic guy, that was one of my big challenges. They'd go to sleep, no worries, and I'd be literally laying awake. And the, the two things I can remember is one, for some reason, I couldn't get comfortable with moving. As in, I couldn't explain to myself why I wasn't able to move. I was like frozen. I, even though, you know, this is my partner, for some reason I felt uncomfortable moving in the bed, changing positions, moving, making noises. I don't know why. It's like, well, was there a newborn baby in the bed? What the hell is going on? What are you trying to Don't wake the baby. I mean, it's. It's, uh, I can't, looking back now, it's ridiculous. But back then, I uh, just, I guess it's my level of development, I, I just couldn't. But all I can really hope is that by kind of sharing awkward, uncomfortable, embarrassing experiences from my own life, my own experience, that it can help you as an autistic person or a parent or carer of an autistic person to kind of open up that level of understanding and acceptance that we are going to be different in our experiences because we have a different brain. We are different people and it's okay. Just, you'll get there, take your time, just allow it to unfold as it should, and, and trust me, eventually you will get there. Oh, and you deserve to get there. Unless, of course, you don't want to, and then that's okay too. Hey, I hope all this sexy talk hasn't got you too hot out of the collar, <laughs> but if it has, you should probably just not wear a collar. I find singlets and t-shirts are also helpful, but it's really entirely up to you. You might want to take your top off. It doesn't, I didn't mean that to be as inappropriate as it sounded. You know, it doesn't, I can't see you anyway. You can, you can see me. This is really awkward. Hey, I've got another video on sexuality and focusing on gender as well. So check that video out or any of my videos. And please take the time to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Share, rate, comment, say hey. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching. Until my next video, we'll talk soon.